Welcome everybody to our law technology and warfare uh, law technology and warfare research cell cyber law webinar. We have joining us today, Professor Gary Korn. Thanks again for joining us. We're really excited to hear what you have to say today. So Professor Korn is the director of the Technology Law and Security Program and an adjunct professor uh, of National Security Law and the Law of Armed Conflict at the Washington College of Law at American University. He served 26 years on active duty in the U.S. Army as a military attorney practicing national security law at the highest levels within the Department of Defense, including five years as the staff judge advocate at U.S. Cyber Command and an international law deployment to Afghanistan. He holds a Juris Doctorate from George Washington University, a Bachelor's of Arts in International Relations from Bucknell University, a Master of Laws from the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School, and a Master of Arts in National Security Studies from the United States Army War College. So uh, again, we're very pleased to have you join us today. If you wouldn't mind, could you go ahead and uh, introduce your topic for today? Sure, thanks. And uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, join this series. Uh, I like the Rubik's Cube in the background. Um, if you're able to do those, you're smarter than me. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this, this is um, part of the, you know, the Lieber Institute up at West Point has an ongoing uh, book series that they put out every couple of years. Um, I've contributed to those in the past, and we were approached for, we, my co-author and I, Professor Eric Jensen at BYU, um, we were approached about contributing to the one that's actually coming available, I think in February is when you can actually get them. But um, and each of these books has, uh, you know, a different theme to them. And the, the theme of this one is big data and conflict. And so, you know, we kicked around some ideas about something to write about. And, um, you know, one issue that, that had been on my mind um, is sort of the role of big data in, in strategic competition with China and Russia, especially China, um, in the AI race, yeah. right? Um, which I think we're all sort of tracking at different levels. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting before I dive deeper into that, that, um, you know, let me, let me get out a caveat that we put in the chapter that um, while we talk about the legal implications from an international law perspective of maybe taking some cyber operations to offset um, arguable Chinese advantages in access to large data sets, right, for, for training and developing AI. We're not recommending as a policy matter, um, you know, the, to do an operation or not. Um, it, it's just sort of a thought piece to, to unpack it. But certainly the issue of, you know, data poisoning, um, data manipulation, and algorithmic um, at manipulation are, are security issues, no doubt, in the development of AI. You can see that reflected in the current executive order that dropped not too long ago. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I, I framed it in one place as, you know, there's this really interesting interrelationship with cybersecurity. So we're getting to a point where you can't have good cybersecurity without AI, but you can't have good AI without good cybersecurity. And so, yeah. you know, there's a little bit of an interesting feedback loop there, but there's definitely, you know, a concern from a defensive perspective um, reflected in the, in the executive order and other places that, that we have to make sure our own game is, is good. Like, yeah. And so um, there's no, I think, question that China um, for a variety of reasons has you know access to pretty massive data sets, right? Um, I, I I certainly don't count myself a, a technologist, you know, an expert in AI, but you know I I talk to experts. I we talk to people at CSET at Georgetown, for example, John Bansimer, General Bansimer, retired Air Force General, um, and others who are there, and um, you know, developing AI there's so many facets to it um, and, and there's so many different components and, and certainly, you know, AI to do what right now, we know we don't have general AI 
right right we have sort of specific um limited sets of of artificial intelligence and um, machine learning directed towards particular kind of goals yeah right and and so some of it has to do with you have to have the right data it's not just a matter of having a lot of data you have to have the right data but you know, it, having large data sets is critical to the training of the models, et cetera. And I would say um, provides an advantage in the train the trainer kind of model. Yeah. So even though you're learning, perhaps you're learning, you know, you're you're developing systems that are not directly, don't have direct military applicability but you're becoming better and more proficient at the process and can adapt that over when you get the right data sets. Um, anyway, all that is to say that there's certainly, you know, the old adage of, and, you know, pardon my, my crass army phrasing, but crap in equals crap out, right? So um, if, assuming one could gain access to the data sets that are being used um, and or the algorithms that are being developed, then arguably you could engage in some manipulation of those data sets, et cetera, um, or deletion or, you know, a range of cyber effects that you might be able to deliver against those that could interrupt or impede um, an adversary's course of development. So I, I anticipate most of our conversation will kind of be about the legality of those sorts of ideas right. uh, as we go. For those who have joined us, um, Professor Korn has indicated a willingness to answer questions throughout. So feel free to type in a question and I will field those to him. Uh, there's a little hand raising button. Uh, we'll also save some time for questions at the end. Um, and Professor Korn, um, I don't know how much you want to get into the executive order versus um, corruption data sets and 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 things like that. I I don't want to derail you one way or the other. Um, I mean, I, I've read the executive order. Um, I've thought about it. It's it's fifty six pages, which to me is not at all surprising because it covers a realm of different issues and risk areas in the development and advancement of AI. Um, and so, you know, some of those are certainly are, are less relevant to military thinking than others. And, and the, um, I mean, I sat through some discussions yesterday, for example, um, uh, uh, Chatham house. So I won't say when, where, with whom it's all, but you know, the, the, the executive order sort of punts over to um, a task to develop a, a policy memorandum, a national security policy memorandum for AI, right? So the, the more specific questions about DOD development and use of AI, the intelligence community development and use of AI aren't really addressed in any depth in the executive order. Um, you know, that's still being worked out. Um, I will say as a side note, and we can go down this trail a little bit. Uh, I've been I've been getting pulled in more to discussions around AI, autonomy, autonomous weapon systems, and so on. These these are discussions that have been going on somewhat somewhat ad nauseum for a while. Um, but it's it's always amazing to me um, just sort of the the lack of understanding by many who engage in the debate about how military operations work <laughs> um, and the assumptions about how humans act in the process of war fighting and et cetera, right? And then the expectations of whether you can transpose or not transpose that onto machine learning or artificial right. intelligence. Um, I, again, Chatham House, but I, you know, one of the remarks I heard yesterday, which for me is one of those shake my head moments was, well, you know, um, if, if you're doing, using these systems to, you know, forget about weapon systems, but even just in decision support systems, 
right? That, you know, there's some reporting out of the current conflict between Israel and Gaza that Israel may be using some systems in for target identification, right? So, well, then you're going to identify a lot more targets. And then there'll be that, there'll be a lot more mistakes. And I'm like, oh, so now identifying lots of targets is not a good thing. I, I it's just, it's a little frustrating. But anyway, I digress. Um, and happy to talk about, you can pepper me with questions where you want, and I'll either know what my answer is or I won't. Um, sure. Well, I, uh, um, I'm, depending on how much time we have, I, I do have some questions about the executive order, but I'm, I'm even more interested in this book chapter that you've written here. And um, you you talked in your introduction a little bit about the garbage in, garbage out kind of an idea. Even before the possibility of injecting garbage into the system, the way machine learning works, there are potential problems because we don't necessarily know what it is that the AI is basing everything on. We, we give it lots of data. It starts to figure things out. And every now and again, there's just a completely, maybe not random, but but unanticipated response that pops out in the midst of a bunch of good and anticipated responses. And that's kind of inherent in machine learning anyway. So how much more of an issue does that become if our adversaries are poisoning our data or if, if we in turn are poisoning their data? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about, I, I believe, sort of the, the black box effect, um, right, where at least to this point, sometimes the developers cannot unpack why it is um, a, a particular string of algorithms concluded what it concluded, you know, why it made a decision the way it made it. Um, and, and, you know, that's that's true regardless of whether you have poison data or not. Um, it, it's... I think that's interesting from a, a number of, of angles, at least if you're thinking about, I mean, from the defensive perspective, you you have to do everything you can, obviously, to prevent what, what we, and it's not my term, I borrowed it from, um, his name's escaping me right now, but um, he's written several books and was a sort of leading edge thinker in cyber in, in the department, but he coined the phrase cybotage, right? You know, playing... Oh, yeah sabotage um we need to obviously prevent that from happening to our own um but when you have lack of explainability as it's been described in some some corners um that exacerbates i'd say arguably the problem of un, you know lack of explainability did something did a system generate the wrong output simply because of a defect in the algorithmic design or whatever? Um, or is that a manipulated output that your adversary did in a covert manner and you don't know? And then the the doubt about that um, might cause you a great deal of hesitation as to whether or not to actually employ the, the capability in the first instance, right? And And that plays both ways. That's arguably could be something that could be advantaged um, in an information ops realm um, and is not something that's necessarily new. Sowing, sowing doubt in your adversary's mind about the reliability of capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of cat and mouse game that'll be going on, I suspect, um, at varying levels. And we have to um, no doubt think about, you know, what we often forget is the goose gander rule of all of this, whether you're interpreting international law or thinking about how you're playing game, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And, um, you know, that's, that's for, that's for policymakers to ultimately work out um, whether or not we feel in positional advantage to conduct certain actions that, um, you know, might come back to bite us. So I think that the largest example of that is the, the the nuclear arms race that quickly, you know, we didn't anticipate that we would lose positional advantage as quickly as we did in the 50s, um, but it, it was game changing. 
So, you know, you have to think your way through all of that as well. But so as we start talking about use of force, sabotage, those those kinds of things, um, and as a little bit more background, your article discussed the volume of data that China is able to gain, how that compares to to the data that we have, um, how how quantity of data can strengthen AI development as as well as quality of data. And I wonder too, can too much quantity of data degrade quality? But can you can you talk a bit about that about China's maybe advantage on that stage? Well, yeah, and and again, and I think we we qualify or caveat, on, you know, to hopefully a sufficient degree in the in the the chapter. But you know, neither I nor Eric Talbot Jensen are are you know AI technologists. Um, and you'll get some differing perspectives, no doubt. And um, so, I, you know, I don't want to, nor, nor do I have the data to quantify specifically, um, you know, who's got more and which is better. Um, you know, I think general understandings is that we remain in, in the lead at the moment as a nation. And I'm biased, but I hope that continues. Uh, <laughs> You know, and part of that is there are a number of factors that go into that, and some of that is, I think, quality of data. Um, but like, there's no question that that we have a very, very different legal and cultural framing around the collection and use of data. Um, you know, and, and we're struggling through a lot of those questions ourselves right now. Um, there's just even in the department and the notions of um, commercially available information, et cetera, and, and, you know, aggregating large data sets. If you look at um, trends, I would say, at least at the Supreme Court, there's a general f notion of, you know, activities that are not really novel or new, but they're different in scope and scale suddenly cause us to, or at least the court, to rethink some traditional um, frameworks of Fourth Amendment and privacy law, et cetera. You know, and just look at Carpenter. And I, I don't think anybody should could say that the, the, the FBI in that case was acted unreasonably based on the current state of the law. Um, the justices just said, holy crap. <laughs> like, the, the kind of surveillance you could have done, um, you know, with with a gumshoe police officer is exponentially different now. And so we're uncomfortable. Right. Um, so the, the cell site location data being kind yeah. of a protective interest in the U.S. Uh, well, along, well, maybe I'll I don't want to get too much into this at the expense of talking law. So let's talk about sabotage uh, yeah. during wartime. It happens all the time during peacetime. Because the this data poisoning that we've kind of alluded to may qualify as a form of sabotage. What is what does that mean as far as international law goes when you were in use ad bellum, not actually at war? Yeah, so um, absolutely, it goes on. Um, you know, you get some varying definitions, but generally, it's you know, let's just say offensive actions to cause disruption or impede or or so on and so forth, and so. You know, we we open with a pretty graphic example of when that happened outside of conflict prior to the U.S. entering into World War One. Um, and you know, people don't realize that in in New Jersey, across from Lower Manhattan, there was the Germans executed a pretty substantial, very physical sabotage operation against um, munitions depots that were set to be sent over to, you know, our allies. So um, there's plenty of, there's plenty of examples in history. Sabotage in and of itself means nothing as a matter of international law, right? There's no, there's no international law that specifically addresses sabotage, just like there's no international law that specifically addresses espionage, right? These are activities that states engage in um, and have not been regulated, sort of if you look at the framing of this issue in 
the Talon manual and other places for espionage. It's not regulated per se. Yeah. And so you then have to fall back to, you know, other standard issues of how you assess the legality of actions under international law. Um, I'm sitting here grading papers for my students going through this right now. <laughs> so um, I'm going through the same process. <laughs> uh, not my favorite part of the job. Um, you know, so obviously it depends on the nature then of the sabotage and the, and the, or the cybotage, right. And, and the effects that are delivered, it kind of falls back to some standard analyses that we went through. Um, and obviously context and facts always matter. And so there's, there's a range. We kind of looked at a different range of, you know, you're talking about, where are you talking about um, an AI system in its development process? Um, you know, is this, in the putative private sector stage of research and development? Is it further down the pipe? Is it closer to actual deployment and use? Right? These are all different things that will, I think, impact various analyses. But, um, you know, as I, I sort of teach my students, um, very internationally wrongful acts, you look at the draft articles on state responsibility, you have the convergence of attribution to a state of an action, that um, for that state would be a breach of an international legal obligation it owes to the victim state, right? Right in general terms, um, no matter how many times I emphasize this for my students in the in the tests I give them, or the when we're reviewing our own actions as proposed operations, attribution isn't really a question because we know who's going to do it. But they still want to go down discussing attribution. Um, and so right, the, the question is, and, and many of who, the folks who are probably on this on this call have just, you've gone through these legal review processes. It's, it's nothing ground shattering. Um, you can either start at the low end or you can start at the high end, but right, the most clearly defined proscription on inter, how states interact right, internationally, is the prohibition in, in the UN Charter on, on the use of force. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, you know, I mean, I'll take a step back to um, my start point for teaching this stuff, whether it's to the students at the law school now, whether it was teaching when I was teaching over at the, the NATO CCD COE, um, and every state has to make a decision about where it stands on all of these questions. But there's the fundamental issue of how you approach international law. Yeah. Which for me, the gateway is through the Lotus principle, um, which many of you are probably familiar with. But, you know, this this was a this was a 1927 case, the first case brought before the Permanent Court of International Justice, which was the court established under the League of Nations, the predecessor to the current International Court of Justice, uh, where a French collier, a coal ship, had an at-sea collision with a Turkish vessel and you know injured and killed Turkish citizens. The Turks got what we would say the habeas grabus on the captain of the French vessel and some others and in instituted criminal prosecution. And France took the case to the PCIJ saying, you, you know, that's, you can't do that. Turkey can't establish um, an authority under international law to prosecute French nationals under these conditions. And the court at that point said, yeah, no, you've got it backwards. Um, you need to point to some proscription in international law that would prevent Turkey from doing this. This is this is inherent in Turkey's sovereignty and states are sovereign equals free to engage with each other as they see fit unless they've agreed to limitations through international law, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's a it's a framing issue. My, my experience has been um, most states, I think, do take a, a Lotus approach to international law. And so one area, as I said, that there's a clear proscription. States have agreed to limit 
how they engage with each other is to say that they will not engage in uses of force in furtherance of their international relations, um, right, specifically against the territorial integrity or political independence of other states or for any other purpose inconsistent with the charter, et cetera. Um, now, there's lots of ink that has been spilled in the last 15, 20 years around the question of, can you actually have a use of force in cyber? And if you can, what does it look like? What's the threshold and so on? And, you know, that's, that's evolving. Um, generally, and if you look at sort of the US and the DOD view, everyone's comfortable saying, well, you know, if it would be a use of force in the kinetic world, just because you can, you, you generate the same effect through cyber, it's still a use of force. Okay. Uh, the question is whether or not it's limited to that or more expansive. And, you know, I would say even, even in the US speeches, submissions to the UNGGE, even in the DOD law of war manual itself, the door is open there. So if you look in the manual, um, you know, it talks about disabling, not just about, you know, causing nuclear meltdown and so on, but if, if you disable a critical logistics system of the DOD through a cyber operation, we might react accordingly. Right. Yeah. Um, and you've got you've got a few states out there who have um, opened the door to the notion of significant economic impact, you know, operations directed at a financial sector. So, you know, one of the things you'd have to do is sort of is is the nature of um, the data poisoning or manipulation, et cetera. What are the actual effects you're generating and would they be coming close to that threshold? I think in the vast majority of cases, the answer would be no. This isn't analogous to blowing up an arms depot in lower or across from lower Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, but that's certainly an issue you'd have to work your way through in any legal analysis of it. Um, and, you know, just to dispel something I hear quite a bit, the fact that you do it covertly doesn't change that. Um, I'm, I'm amazed how often I hear people say, yeah, but it's covert. That doesn't make it legal. That's not a, like from an international perspective, and I'm not advocating against covert action or operations. I'm just saying that's just, that's a, that's a, that's lowering the risk profile of, of getting caught. Um, and for good reason at times, but it doesn't change the legality of it. So, you know, that's, that's the first question you'd have to to push your way through um, is the operation engaging in. Now, it's an interesting, as a side note, um, there's been lots of discussion. We're talking about data and the impacts on data um, from a LOAC perspective and the discussions of what you know constitutes attack under Article 49 of AP1 and the LOAC, et cetera. You know, you've got this ongoing debate as to whether or not data are tangible or not. Yeah. Um, that's great, that's interesting. Um, some people have, I think, tried to transpose that over to the use ad bellum, use of force question, um, but that's not really, it's a very different analysis. Uh, and so the, the impacts from data deletion could be very different and analyze very differently from a use of force perspective than in a narrower sense of, I think, a LOAC perspective, right? So um, again, just an interesting side note in how we think about international law and these issues aligning or not. Yeah, and, and one thing that you mentioned, both in a kind of a self-defense context, as well as talking about um, countermeasures, is, is the idea of preemption and anticipation and how in talking about cyber and data, things happen so quickly. Um, you can't not have that conversation. So either context, we, we could start with from a self-defense sort of a perspective or talking about countermeasures. I, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on both. Sure. So, I mean, um, if, if 
in an, an in analyzing any particular operation, you your legal conclusion is yeah this this would actually risk being crossing the threshold into a use of force. Um, then it's presumptively unlawful. It's prohibited unless you have, in, in the terminology of the law of state responsibility, a circumstance precluding the wrongfulness of that action, i.e. a justification in law, right? Um, yeah. And right, let's, let's toss consent aside. That's not going to happen. Let's toss uh, uh, authorization from the Security Council aside. That's not going to happen. Um, there are a few others, but when you're talking about something that amounts to force, the the one on the table is obviously self-defense. And as we know, um, in its strictest understanding, Article 51 recognizes states' inherent right to use force and self-defense against an armed attack. Um, and then you get into the dis, you know the question of whether you can anticipatorily use force. Um, there are some states that still, I think, quite hypocritically or you know facially will say, no, 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 Article 51 says what Article 51 says. There is no such thing as anticipatory self-defense. That is not the US view. That's a minority view, I would say. Um, but then the question is, what are the conditions that you have to satisfy to, uh, to exercise self-defense prior to an actual attack against you? You know, and I use the term prior to because obviously there's um, you know, a longstanding understanding under the Caroline case, et cetera, that there must be imminence. What is imminent has come under a lot of discussion in the last, again, 15, 20 years, starting with the Bush doctrine, which was kind of pulled back. Um, it was somewhat invoked, not entirely, but as 2003 Iraq and so on. And so uh, that brought the question. But um, so, you know, you get a spectrum. Um, Ashley Deeks has written a few things on this, which are pretty good. Uh, you know, Ashley, who was recently at the, the NSC Legal Advisor's Office. Um, you know, there's anticipatory self-defense is the traditional framing of it. Um, you might have preemptive, you might have preventive, essentially you're just getting further and further left of boom, so to speak. And at a certain point, you, you know, you've, you've untethered yourself entirely from traditional understandings of when you can use force as an exception, right? So when we, when we tie this into the artificial intelligence sort of race, um, assuming for example, China was going to somehow use AI against us. Um, we could even assume that somehow it will qualify as a use of force. In in the end, it's hard. It's harder to see a circumstance where there would be anticipatory actions versus preemptive or preventative. And so, you you, you talked about. And you wrote an article a few years ago also about the possibly evolving view on the world stage, specifically with regard to Israel bombing uh, Syria or I Iraq and then Syria and the different responses in the international kind of yeah. stage. You've done your homework. <laughs> well, I, I used that to teach some of my cyber law class as well. I thought it was really interesting. Um, but I guess... My question is, is there a place for that? When when we're looking at the development of AI, um, does that doctrine even inform what we may or may not do depending on how we think China is planning on using their AI developments? Yeah, there's there's a there's a paradox in buried in here that I think we tried to wrestle with a little bit. And that is um, the further away you are in the R&D process from fielding an AI system, um, the further away you are, um, I'd say, from linking that into a state sovereign prerogative, which implicates prohibited intervention issues and other things. 
Um, but you're also further away from an argument of imminence to justify your action, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and imminence is imminent threat of an armed attack. For the U.S., use of force armed attack, one and the same, and that's, that's fine. But still, um, an imminence and threat are a matter of intent and capability. And so there's a lot you have to look into there. But this all sort of traces back to, um, you know, the, like I said, the Bush doctrine, which, you know, it's very interesting. I don't, I don't, the, the Bush doctrine maybe was not as well articulated as it could have been, or the timing was poor, et cetera. But the fundamental um, rationale was actually, I think, pretty sound. And that rationale was when we're dealing with modern weapons technologies, nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think they were even thinking across the horizon yet to cyber truly or, or AI. But where even for nuclear weapons, the decision window is pretty tight between launch and impact, um, et cetera. And the consequences are obviously catastrophic. Yeah. We can't think of imminence in the same framing as we did in 1836, when the maximum effective range of your most lethal weapon system might have been a mile. Yeah. <laughs> and so the advanced warning time of a force deploying to position itself to actually engage with any significant force against you gave you a much, much longer window of moment of deliberation, right? So that is that is changing and that has to be taken into account. And, you know, there's the Tal Manual and others talk about it as the, the last clear window yeah. of an opportunity to act. And, and that resonates with me. That That's an entirely different discussion about other areas where we have imported that notion into self-defense concepts. I wrote about this separately non-cyber years back, but um, like- so in that, Sorry, in that sense, artificial intelligence, whether to be used in a cyber attack or possibly even in, in aiding AI-enabled kinetic attacks, in that sense, it's a little bit more like the nuclear question in that short window of opportunity maybe even shorter in the timing. Destructive effects, maybe not so much, but they're also very different, as you point out, because nuclear weapons are inherently uh, attack-oriented versus artificial intelligence is very dual use. There, there are so many civilian uses, governmental uses that don't involve attack that it, it makes it a very different question. Yeah, so, I mean, this is all you know, to unpack any particular factual scenario. But I would say um, I'm not a fan of dual use as a term. Uh, if we're talking about use ad bellum, use in bello concepts, et cetera, I mean, it, it's either something, a capability that has been incorporated into the military or it hasn't, or is designed and intended to be, you would need the facts to understand that. Um, right. And so, yeah, I mean, I think the notion that, um, you know, we identify some R&D lab that's general, you know, exploring and developing AI generally uh, that may have civilian um, applications, et cetera, that we could simply drop a bomb on that research and development center is kind of ludicrous right because somewhere down the line uh you know that may develop to the point where they can repurpose it right or dual purpose it into military use um but that's you know that's very different than something that has already been brought into the arsenal right or is you have the intelligence to tell you is very specifically within an r d chain um, to meet military requirements. So you, you've got to unpack the facts more. Um, 
But frankly, I think, yeah, we could talk about self-defense, et cetera. Um, the same discussions are at play as in other areas. The, the imminence question is challenging. The last clear window of opportunity, um, the OODA loop is condensing more and more in, in decision-making generally because of technology. And that all has to get factored into how you're postured to deal with the problem. Um, but by the same token, um, you know, AI that's being developed even for, you know, let's say, a, a decision support system for logistics deployment is not presenting the same level of consequence and imminent threat that, you know, it, it would be for some catastrophic weapon system. So, you know, all these, these are all factors that you'd have to be looking at. And frankly, I think it's a little bit of a red herring because a lot of the operations you could potentially conduct wouldn't amount to use as a force to begin with. Yeah. Right. So on, on a related but different note, when we're not rising to the level of use of force, but again, kind of the overall topic of our discussion is whether it's lawful to kind of sabotage development of AI, you talk about countermeasures. And I, I think it's particularly interesting how you pointed out in this book chapter that uh, anticipatory countermeasures isn't really an accepted idea. But with regard to AI and cyber in particular, uh, if I understand you right, you kind of advocate for opening up to the acceptance of anticipatory countermeasures in that context. Yeah. I, um, so again, like let's baseline a little bit. Countermeasures is another quote unquote circumstance precluding the wrongfulness of an otherwise internationally wrongful act. It's another justification like self-defense and you have to meet the, um, you know, the condition sets that, that would allow the execution of a quote unquote countermeasure. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. And a lot of that is, you know, currently in debate. Um, you know, we should mention that in the context of cyber, it has come up quite a bit. And we have 30 plus states now that have come out with their positions as you know, national positions on certain international law questions related to cyber. Countermeasures has figured prominently in many of them. And some states have been questioning the premises, um, you know, the purported conditions that are laid out in the draft articles on uh, state responsibility, right? A document prepared by the International Law Commission, et cetera. Um, one of which is the, the availability and existence of collective countermeasures, which the International Law Commission said, mm, we don't think so. Um, some states, Estonia, others have come out and said, no, we do believe that there's a basis for collective countermeasures. Go figure that Estonia um, would want to see recognition of that. Um, and, and I think similarly, you know, the issue of anticipatory countermeasures. The, the, the problem is countermeasures generally understood um, is a little bit different than self-defense. They actually, they actually have the same pedigree. They both branched off from the law of reprisals, right? And, and you had forceful forcible reprisals and non-forcible reprisals and the forcible prong evolved into more into the use at bellum structure we talked about um, where you do have anticipatory and you do have collective self-defense etc um, you know where that logic chain broke in the other direction um, i haven't done enough research to fully put my finger on but there's definitely a break in the logic chain there and so you know um, countermeasures are generally understood as being aimed at um, the, you know, the purpose is not self-protection in the same sense as self-defense. It's, you've got a state that's in violation of international law, and this is a tool of compellence to bring that state back into compliance. And so it needs to be tailored and proportional to that aim. And if that other state has not yet breached international law, then what is the basis for trying to compel them to come back into compliance? Yeah, there, there's a there's a an intellectual problem buried in there. But you know, to your point, um, it, 
if it's fairly obvious that a state is imminently going to violate. I mean, you know, countermeasures is just another self-help remedy in some sense. And um, should it be viewed more as a self-protective remedy, right, than, than, than it is maybe currently. So, you know, each state has to work its way through what it thinks the current state of the law is on that. But, um, you know, that again assumes that the operation you would be conducting would violate international law. And if it's not a use of force, then you walk down that ladder of, okay, well, then what else is it? Well, is it a prohibited intervention in the internal affairs of that state? Um, you know, and there's lots you have to unpack again, factually, to, to walk that dog to whether or not cybotage of some level would amount to a coercive action against a core sovereign prerogative of the other state right, which is meant to um, deprive the other state of its free will decision making over that core sovereign prerogative. Um, and, you know, we walked through that and framed it out. Um, and I think oftentimes there's ways you could do these that would not cross that threshold either. Um, so you wouldn't even be getting into a countermeasures discussion, but but certainly it's there. Um, so, okay. so and I do want to have time to open it up for questions. And, and for those who are attending, I, I will enable you to talk if you want to verbalize a question or you can type it in. Um, Professor Korn, I think we can take just a couple minutes on one more thing before we do that. And I'll leave it up to you if you want to talk more about non-intervention um, or talk about sovereignty uh, or necessity. Yeah, um, I think it's necessary to talk about sovereignty. Um, yeah, I mean, that's obviously if below the below the level of a prohibited use of force, um, <laughs> there's a there's a an ongoing debate about the normative function or status of sovereignty. Um, is it a term that describes legal personality um, of states? Is it a general principle that undergirds much of what we see in the law of state responsibility, the law regulating international relations, or is it itself a primary rule that can be violated? We know the Talent Manual takes the position that it is a primary rule that can be violated and then offered theories of how that, what the thresholds are, or how it can be violated. Um, I've yet to be persuaded. I, I find the UK's official position that there's insufficient evidence of custom and state practice to establish it as a rule of international law. Um, you yeah, know, but to be fair, there's a number of states who have come out um, who have sided with the Talon view. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. Some of them, I think, are cited I'd say sort of incorrectly or more robustly than what their positions actually state. But, you know, it's certainly a question. Um, the U.S. has not articulated a firm position on it. Um, you know, we do have a DOD speech a couple of years ago at the Cyber Command Legal Conference that, let's just say, expressed sympathy and solidarity with the U.K. view. Um, but it's still somewhat of an open question. So, you know, as a legal advisor, you have to work your way through that. Um, if it's not a rule of international law, it's not an impediment to conducting certain operations. I, I think one thing of interest in all these statements that have come out is that there it has forced thinking about, you know, at least what it means if you are a sovereignty as a rule state. And does it foreclose any cyber operations cross-border that might generate effect. And I think pretty resoundingly, they've said, no, it doesn't go that far. There are There is a space of operations and effects that would not cross a th sovereignty violation threshold. So, you know, ongoing discussion there about what international law has to say about all that. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and allow uh, participants to talk, or you can type in questions. We'll give you 30 seconds of silence to formulate your questions if you like before 
before I ask any. So well, there's a bunch of people jumping on. Hello, Vicky. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't start my stopwatch. I'm not sure if that was 30 seconds, but um, seeing no hands or typed questions yet, I'll start, since we're talking about sovereignty, with the, um, with the vastly differing views of how state sovereignty applies to cyber operations, how much should sovereignty concerns impact U.S. decisions on whether and how to interact with, for example, China in the AI context? Well, you know, there's, it's, it all sort of, to me, depends on how you're defining risk, right, in the conduct of any particular activity or operation. And, you know, there's, there's the question of whether or not, as legal advisors, we are in a position to legally object, and I'm preaching to the choir for this audience, um, and I, I'd say given the current state of affairs, sovereignty is not necessarily something that you could invoke as a legal objection. Um, but given the state of play, and obviously lots of states, well, you know, a subset of states of the 190-ish states out there that have said they view it differently, um, you know, that presents some diplomatic, dip, you know, diplo legal risk, diplomatic legal risk. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you should consider it. And, and um, as far back as 2012 and Harold Coe's speech at Cyber Command, it said, you know, we, and, and Brian Egan echoed this, we, we take into account, right, um, the sovereignty of other, of the other states involved, et cetera. Um, so, you know, again, it's, it's a question of, I think, more risk and political decision making about that risk as opposed to a clear legal objection at this point i uh, i like that because it i think it's important as legal practitioners when we give advice to not say something is illegal when it's not if, if, even if there are other reasons not to do it because um especially in cyber where things are sometimes unclear international law serves a great purpose in giving us predictability on how states may respond to particular actions. And if something is bright line legal or not legal, then then yes, that's that's something we should advise on. But even when it's not clear or when it's not illegal per se, we can still use all of these things that we've been talking about as a way to predict what responses might be and, and give advice on that basis, just being clear to delineate this is advice saying this is legal or not legal versus this is advice saying here's how states are likely to respond. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Vicki Balloon's on the, I can see her on the call. She worked for me at Cyber Command, did phenomenal work for me. Um, and she heard me probably pound the podium more than a few times on this point. Um, and, and everyone can approach their practice how they see fit. But, you know, I was very strict with, the the attorneys that work for me do not substitute your prudential advice for legal advice um, and do not do not um, do that in a way that circumscribes the commander's discretion and prerogatives right um, you have to be very very careful there and you know I think by and large we all understand that and we gain the trust and confidence of the commanders we advise um, the operators we advise, and so they ultimately want to hear that prudential advice. Um, but we have to be, to your point, very, very disciplined in how we're presenting it and relating it to actual legal legal views. Sure. Still seeing no questions from the audience. I might go back a little bit to our discussion of how quantity and quality of data can impact how quickly and efficiently and how well we can develop artificial intelligence. Um, I don't know if you've looked into this or, or if you have an opinion, but would any domestic law prevent the U.S. from, shall we say, borrowing uh, China's vast data sets if, if we have that capability 
particularly data on its citizens, for example. We're, we're very hesitant to collect a lot of data on our own citizens. We know China collects a lot of data on their citizens. Do you see any reason why we would not be able to kind of borrow that data if we had that capability? Um, I think in the sense of misappropriation or larceny. I, I um, <laughs> yeah. I have to think that through, but I think the answer is no. I mean, we collect, right? Look, we're, we're going through 702 reauthorization discussions right now and so on and so forth. But the underlying premise to all that is non-US citizens overseas do not benefit other, other than the PPD 28 policy question. They don't benefit from the protections of the Fourth Amendment, et cetera. Um, you know, there's some particularities in U.S. law that you'd have to work through, whether whether it's ECPA or whatever, um, and whether those would have anything to say about the IC or DOD doing the collecting. Um, but as a general matter, I'd say no. Um, Sir, uh, Colonel Ballou, she says uh, she still lives by that rule for providing prudential advice versus legal advice. So thank you for that. Um, would you be able to summarize now kind of your, your conclusions, I guess, and Professor Jensen's, at least as you concluded in the article, as, as when and whether uh, we, the U.S., could or should take action in possibly preventing the full-scale development of AI? Yeah, I think, I think we tried to steer away from the should or should not. Um, sure. Ultimately, that is a very, very delicate policy call. Um, and that, you know, to state the, the blinding flash of the obvious, um, and we've talked about, depending on the very specific facts and nature, um, it's, we certainly couldn't say that it would be per se unlawful. Uh, there, there are avenues by which you might be able to generate effect or create the impression or suspicion that we have generated effect, which might be just as effective in sowing doubt, right, as to the reliability of the systems that are being developed. So um, I think that's the general summation of what we, what we said. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, with your permission, I'll go ahead and post a link to the article we've discussed in the when I post this video on YouTube. Uh, would that be all right? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, again, thanks for joining us. And everybody who is also on the webinar, thank you for joining us as well. Um, we'll, we'll end it right there. So thanks a lot, Professor Korn. Really appreciate you being on today. No, thank you. And I see some familiar names in the tiles. Um, they're all hiding, trying to be covert, but their names are there. So I, I see you and, and uh, you know, greetings to those. All right. Thank you. All right, goodbye.